Hey everybody, and welcome back to Wednesdays with Watson. As I mention every time, if you have been following my journey, by now you know that my name is Amy Watson, and I am your host. This podcast is part two of an interview with a former student of mine who shares some of the same trauma as I do. As I mentioned in the intro of part one of Autumn's story, we are highlighting Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but what we found And recording this podcast is that there are so many things, so many universal principles pertaining to forgiveness and then also pertaining to the hardest person to forgive. It doesn't take rocket science to know who that is just by the title of this podcast. And so without further ado, let's drop back into this conversation with this amazing young lady where we left off where she was going to tell us the hardest person of all for her to forgive and all of her trauma. I bet that your answer to that question probably would be the same. Let's see what else this young one has to say to us. So again, as I was preparing what I wanted to discuss with you on the podcast today and writing out this list, because that's that's where I started, was writing this list of traumas and things and people who I needed to forgive. The more I thought about it and I read it over, this, this list with thing after thing that happened to me, and I realized that there was a similarity in all of them, a common person that I had to forgive. And surprisingly, this person was the absolute hardest person for me to forgive. And to this day, I wake up every single morning and I pray to the Lord to just give me some type of strength to forgive this person and give this person the ability to change and see their value as a child of the very most high God. And that person who was so hard for me to forgive, it it wasn't my ex-husband. It wasn't those who had abused me prior to him. It wasn't the youth leader who had molested me for a length of time as I was a child. It it wasn't those who had caused me all this pain, the trauma, or abandoned me from my childhood. That person was me. That person is me. And I'm the person who I struggle with forgiving the most, myself. Wow. Uh, Wow and ouch that 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 will preach and i'm not gonna lie it even now uh, takes my breath away forgiving ourselves you've also hit on some guilt it's the best friend of shame and it paralyzes all of us and so i want you to tell me more why did you feel the dirt of unforgiveness as it pertained to yourself when you didn't do it which is such a a common theme in trauma victims, trauma survivors, we think something is wrong with us. What do you think you did that you needed to forgive yourself for? Well, when I saw that common thread within this list of traumas, I had to kind of ask myself why. Why is it so hard for me to forgive myself? And what exactly do I need to forgive myself for when these things, most of them, like you said, were done to me? Exactly. And and that answer, it's, it's not a simple one. Um, I think a huge part of it just boils down to self-worth. Um, when I say self-worth, I'm not just referring to how I view myself personally or my confidence, awareness of, of who I am. I do feel as though I'm pretty honest enough with myself about who I am and how much I value myself, which is a great amount. I don't really struggle with self-esteem or confidence in that way. And I know that I'm strong, especially through everything that I've gone through. And I know that I have a purpose just as everyone else does. However, valuing myself and requiring others to acknowledge my value are both a part of that self-esteem and self-worth. And I'm a giver, I'm a helper. You are a giver and a helper. And I I think along the way, while we're busying ourselves with just pouring our love and time and helpfulness into other people, whether it's for partly our own selfish reasons of trying to kind of push away our own stuff and avoid dealing with it. So we try to help others and pour ourselves into that. Sometimes we still lose sight of those boundaries. Yeah, or never even know how to, to, to draw them. It's just so huge and so true. Um, I think our choice of community is vital to our healing and helping us release guilt is vital too. I know for me, and this is where, you know, so oftentimes I find my value in helping other people 
and what other and I, and I set these ridiculous standards for myself in, in, in every vein of life. Um, it's never enough. I'm never enough. I never work hard enough. I never write enough. I never podcast enough. And I live with a lot of guilt, even if it's like resting. Like yesterday, I took a Sabbath day and I rested and I read and I, and, and I was just struggling with guilt. And without even knowing it, you have highlighted what we've been talking about all season long, this idea of stepping into our, one, our Psalm 139-ness, that fearfully and wonderfully madeness. Um, so I'm going to have to continue to go to my corner and do some thinking after this conversation. I have a great community and all of them um, are people, friends, close five-star friends. And, but I think this idea of forgiving ourselves is this last step to cleanliness that you describe. And I know that I've got friends that need to hear this too that aren't trauma survivors. So our own guilt is so prevalent that we may, we may stay away from those trauma puddles, but we wallow in the ones that we make for ourselves. And that is yes. frustrating to me in some ways that I, that I make those for myself. I set these standards for myself. And that's why, you know, I, I led into this with community because the community will help us stay away from those puddles that we make ourselves and, and, and really help us step into our, our Psalm 139-ness. But, but what, what is one thing in your experience that makes it so hard to forgive yourself or to let yourself off the hook? Forgiving myself um, for making... Forgiving myself for thinking that I'm not worthy of love. We lose sight of the respect that we should be receiving from others just as we are respecting them. And we lose sight of while we are emptying ourselves into others, we often are not being filled back up. And we often depreciate our own value by allowing others to essentially treat us like garbage. Wow. Uh, I, I got to tell you, you're, you're preaching to me right now. And as a, as, as an Enneagram two, uh, which I've mentioned many times on this podcast, actually, I think I started the season th saying I was an eight, but I kept taking the test again until I was two. No, I'm just kidding. I just took it one more time. <laughs> but I'm a helper. Uh, but you right now, in fact, are as a student are schooling the teacher. So I just want you to continue to talk to us a little bit more about this, not, you know, not letting people depreciate us because that makes it hard to forgive ourselves right there. Um, and we don't need any help. So keep talking. Yes. Um, I'm actually an Enneagram too as well. So it takes one to know one, <laughs> but I think we often just, we stay in those friendships, those relationships, the marriage, whatever it might be, because we forget that we are precious and we should be treated as such. And it wears you down and it makes you feel small and confused. And all the while these traumas are happening to us often caused by others. And we don't even really recognize that they don't value us, that they're not appreciating us. And really it boils down to them not being capable of loving us. And if we surround ourselves with those things long enough, we begin to believe those lies. And we begin to believe that it's all we deserve, that we're not good enough for anything better and that we don't deserve to be appreciated or to be respected for someone to treat us kindly or, or ultimately be loved. And we might quote unquote love ourselves, but we don't surround ourselves with others who are capable of loving us. And it's dangerous. It cultivates this feeling of I'm not good enough and I don't deserve to be forgiven. And truly that's the farthest thing from the truth 100 percent. like as far as the east is from the west from the truth and it, it really is so important um to surround ourselves by those people but also not find our worth in those people or accomplishments um yes. but yeah we part of this this struggle that we have to let ourselves off the hook is not helped if we don't surround ourselves with people like that like you're talking about as we continue to mention, since this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I want to talk about this question that I had to forgive myself for. Um, a lot of survivors deal, deal with a lot of guilt and shame from this question. And it's one that really makes me so angry. And this is the question. Why did you stay so long? Mm. This question feels like an indictment to me, even 12 years later. And it absolutely is a puddle of guilt and shame, which I will willingly step in and wallow in and get dirty again, even this many years later. Don't you agree that that question, we, it's got to stop? Yes, yes. It absolutely gets me too. And unfortunately, it's one I've heard way too often. Um, it's a hurtful question that people ask. 
ask. And I think even if it's with good intentions, it's not helpful at all, honestly. So for those who are listening, if you love somebody who's been in a domestic violence situation, please be sensitive um, to not put that placement of blame on the survivor, because really that's what that question does. And you are off the hook for staying so long, um, my lovely survivor sister. And, and so am I. And so is anyone else who might be listening. And even if you still are currently staying with an abuser, if you don't have that community, like we were talking about, you know, let us, let us be that community seed that's planted for you. Truly, I think I had a community. I, I grew up in a private Christian. Christian school, a Christian home with my family. We attended church. Um, I was very heavily involved in church and I'm a sign language interpreter. So I also interpreted in church. I've taught Sunday school for the deaf um, and I've really remained pretty steadfast in my faith even throughout all of these things. However, I think along the way I was hurt by people who I probably should have been able to trust. And mm -hmm. it made me a little bit jaded. And at times I think I fell away from that. Um, I didn't want to maybe hear what my community of close friends and family had to say. And I maybe thought I knew better. Um, I think I lost my innocence a little bit earlier than I should have, or definitely earlier than I should have. And it forced me to grow up in a lot of ways. And when you're sort of an adult in this child's body, sometimes it's hard to relate to peers. And um, when the things you're dealing with, they just sometimes seem so much bigger and what other people are dealing with, not to discredit them, but in those moments, they feel like so trivial. And life just unfolds differently for those who, who have to kind of be an adult in a child's body. So you learn lessons in a hard way. It's so true. It's so true. And I, it's really, really hard for me to, to hear that, that you didn't have a childhood. I never would have seen that in, in 10th grade autumn. And um, I just want to say that I'm so, so sorry that you lost your childhood because I really do understand. I understand being a, an adult in a, in a kid's body. And I'm so sorry. And, and I know you do understand that. And, and I'm sorry also for those who've experienced these things and whether it's something that's specific to your family or just a um, trauma or experience that you've gone through that kind of just force you to wake up to what the world is really like um, earlier than you probably should have. Those are tough experiences. But I think through every lesson, I've always had a good community of select few people. Um, my very best friend who I've known since we were barely even five years old, Alexis, who loves Jesus probably even more loudly and lovely than I ever could. Um, she's my voice of reason always because she's just always wanting better for me than I think I've ever wanted for myself. And she always is the one that thumps me over the head and reminds me, hey, don't do that. You know, you're worthy of so much more than this. And um, and I appreciate that so very much. Hey, I got to just interject here. Uh, shout out to Alexis, who I also had as a student and her family, uh, part of that community that I talk about that um, that stood in so many gaps for me. But sorry to interrupt you, but I just had to I had to shout out to Alexis and to the whole Friedman family uh, because they absolutely stood in gaps for me. Uh, but that community, we're coming back to a community. But you also had somebody <laughs> else. Who was that? Yes. And I'm sure Alexis will be listening and she better be listening. Um, yes. And, and my mom, Tammy, yes. who's unfortunately been through her own great deal of trauma as well. Uh, she's always been a powerhouse and a huge source of strength for me throughout my life. Um, there were times I wasn't able to fight for my own life. I was ready to give up and she was the person that fought for me to literally to stay alive. And as I've been planning for this podcast today and she had came to mind, I sent her a message and I had said, I just want to let you know, I love you and thank you for being you because it's made me me, which I, I couldn't have really summed it up into any smaller words, but truly those two women, um, they are Jesus's feet. Mm -hmm. They don't just quote unquote, talk the talk. They truly walk the walk in, in what they do on a daily basis. And, and I'm thankful that now I have not just the two of them, but other wonderful people who are a part of my community and reason for continuing. And the main ones being my children, obviously, but we, we do this for them, you know, for the children, for the next generations to yeah. hopefully teach them these lessons to be able to live 
and have a life that's full of happiness and we want them to learn to love and to be kind to everyone. And we want to be able to give them those tools to learn to forgive others, to forgive themselves and to know that, you know, even if they fall short to give themselves grace and to, as, as a parent, especially to give your child the tools to be strong within this world and to know what their worth and their value is, which is truly priceless. And, and understand, this is not me saying that we shouldn't help those who don't help us um, in return. It's not a tit for tat thing. And it's not a matter of saying, hey, don't love somebody if they're not capable of loving you back. Because of course we, especially from a biblical sense, we want sure. to be like Jesus. And I'm sure there were tons of people in his life who, who were truly kind of unlovable and he chose to love them and take a chance on them anyway. And um, I think though, being aware of the effects that it has on you is so important, especially for your self-worth, as we've talked about, it's, it's so important. And making sure to check in with yourself and have your community that checks in with you. Um, just kind of making sure you're taking care of yourself as well and not forgetting your own value in that midst of trying to show other people their value. Those are the things that you have to kind of ask yourself. It's a part of self-care, self-love. And, and yes, a huge part of that includes forgiving yourself. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I mean, I, I, I'm still processing this and I, I had the opportunity to know what we were going to talk about. Um, I am so grateful for that. For, I have a community of people of which you are one um, who helps me because I talk all the time, maybe not on this podcast. I don't know that I've mentioned, but I often feel like when I wake up in the morning, I wake up in the basement because I didn't have somebody investing into me until I was well into my teens telling me that I am precious in the sight of the most high God. And so I have to claw my way back to this ground floor of Psalm 139 is that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that I have to brush my teeth, that I have to drink water, that I have to eat, that I have to do these things. And so when we, when we, when this podcast headed in the, in the, in the vein of self-forgiveness, it really slammed in my chest. You had mentioned this verse in Psalm 32. So for the people out there struggling to, to, to forgive yourself, there's biblical Re biblical direction and how to do that. And Autumn, you mentioned a verse to me in Psalm that just slammed into my chest as I try to cleanse that own guilt and shame and unforgiveness from my own soul. What was that verse? It's Psalm chapter 32, verse five. And it says, I acknowledged all the mistakes to you and you forgave them. And it's, it's a pretty simple verse, but right. it has a lot of power behind it. Um, the, the principle is that if God's forgiving you and he is so great and so much bigger and better than us, then who are we to decide that we're not worthy of forgiving ourselves? And as it pertains to forgiveness, another verse in Colossians chapter three, verse eight, it states, you must put these away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And if we're able to, for, to refrain from those feelings towards others who have wronged us and forgive them, then why do we still think that it's okay to do these things against ourselves? Why do we think that it's okay to slander ourselves with our own negative thoughts or be angry with ourselves for our past choices or things that have been done against us? Yeah, complete face palm moment for me because yeah, who am I? So let's say that I have valid reasons to have guilt and shame in my heart, that I need forgiveness from God or from somebody else, but who am I? Uh, and, and Chrissy mentioned this on one of the Memory Keeper podcasts. It's like looking in the mirror and telling the great artist, you suck, basically. And yeah. so, you know, and, and so who am I to not forgive myself? If, if, if you can't get in your mind, listeners, that you probably don't have anything to forgive yourself for, that guilt and shame have no place in your uh, heart that can be so clean. Um, you know, we don't want you to be dirty. I, I, I don't want to be dirty. I don't want to be stained. And so this has just got me thinking, Autumn. I bet you got us all thinking. What else you got for us while you're on your roll here? So I just, I wanted to say a few things because it's on my heart and I, I want to let the listeners know, especially you matter. Amen. And please hear me when I say that Woo! you matter. Yes. You are, you are able to forgive others who have done possibly far worse to you than you could have ever afflicted on another person. You deserve forgiveness too. 
Forgive yourself for staying in that relationship too long. Forgive yourself for not speaking up and keeping certain secrets that you knew were too, too dangerous for you. Forgive yourself for avoiding getting a divorce because maybe you didn't want to receive judgment from those who might look down on you. Forgive yourself for the things that you did or said that were maybe out of character because you were under duress or crippled. I know by fear, trauma, forgive yourself for that hurt that you may have caused others along the way because sometimes people that are hurting, they, they bleed on other people. It's that saying of when a person is wounded, you can't help but bleed on others. Forgive yourself for those things, for maybe the lies that you had told, because that's how you coped with that day, that experience. Forgive yourself for not loving yourself better. Forgive yourself for yesterday, for today, for tomorrow, because please get it in your brain that Jesus has already forgiven you. He's already yes. died for all of those things when he bore that weight of our sins and everyone else's sin, and he died on that cross. Please just forgive and forgive yourself. Yeah, it's such a cost, such a price that he paid. Even if you don't share our faith, um, it, we, I, I, you, if there's any higher power in your life, um, you, I, I, I really struggle if you don't share our faith. And, and I'll, and, but the huge tie-in here um, is that this guilt loves isolation. Um, yes. And so if you don't share our faith, find the community that, that refreshes you and that, that speaks life into you. If you can't speak these words into you, find a community that can. Um, and particularly if you share the belief and the star of the story, even if you and he have some work to do right now, forgive yourself because such a high price was paid by him and by you um, with just the suffering you went through. There's no reason to put yourself through more suffering. You know what I'm saying as PTSD people? And I know you wanted to remind us that it doesn't happen overnight, right? Yes, exactly. It doesn't happen overnight. For me, um, I think my mom actually was the one that said it to me first. It's not a matter of taking it day by day. Sometimes it's minute by minute. Sometimes it's breath by breath. And, so you know, true. it doesn't happen every single day. You know, things are different. And those who struggle like yourself and I with PTSD or complex PTSD, things, they resurface and then they need to be forgiven multiple times over and over again. And it's not easy, but it is necessary. It's necessary that you forgive yourself along with your aggressors because that's how progress is made and it's important that we are able to move past that and to forgive ourselves so we're not still dragging along that extra weight yeah it's so true it is an everyday process and oftentimes paying attention to yourself is work self-care is work um i have some weird things that i do as it pertains to walking through all the things daily i won't bore you with that but uh because really this is your show i'm curious um how do you keep this concept of self-forgiveness and putting on clean clothes every day out in front of you? So I'll share one of the things that I've started doing that's really helped me kind of be more mindful of my own worth and mindful of forgiving myself. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term mantra, but yeah. essentially a mantra or mantras are, they're, they're the same thing as basically words of affirmation. They're simple sounds, words, phrases that you recite, whether it's to yourself or out loud, and you kind of just repeat them over and over positive affirmations. I really enjoy yoga and meditation. So for me personally, I like repeating mantras as a part of my yoga practice, but I also do it when I'm in prayer or just throughout the day to kind of get through. Um, I do this with my children too, to instill this in them, because I think it's so important that that self-conversation that you sort of have in your head that's ongoing to have those as positive things um, to uplift yourself and, and others. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, it's called The Help, but in the movie, there's a maid, one of them, who works for a family that has a very young daughter, and a great deal of the maid's responsibilities are to care for this young girl, and every day she looks at the child, and, and she gets down on eye level with this child on her hands and, and knees, and she says to her, she says, you is kind, and you is smart, and you is important. And I love that so very much. So I can't even say that I came up with this idea on my own because it, it definitely partly came from that. I definitely um, have I, chills. I, yeah, I, I just, I love it. It's that great. movie was so amazing. As you mentioned, she got down on her level. So yes. oftentimes as community members of people who need us, we need to be on their level. Oftentimes yes. in the basement, as I mentioned, I love that movie. You is kind, you is smart, you is special. Uh, but yes. yes, and it's also a very biblical 
this get into getting into the habit of speaking kindly to yourself is biblical. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about that because I loved what you had to say about that. Yes, getting into the habit of speaking kindly to yourself, even if it's just inside your head and not something that you speak out loud, that perception that you carry around of yourself, it's so important. And when you're able to respect and love and forgive yourself, it helps others around you follow that example and respect and love and forgive themselves and you as well. And I try to encourage others to speak kindly to themselves, um, not just by saying, hey, speak kindly to yourself, but by pouring that into them too and saying, hey, hey, you have value and hey, you have purpose. And if somebody says, oh, I feel, you know, sad or, or things like that, acknowledging those things, but then also lifting them back up because it's so important that yes. we show that action of lifting others. And women, like in particular, women in particular, women in particular, we're getting better, but, but we are, we're world-class um, we, <laughs> we went, we went at life of tearing each other down. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like pick her up partners. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fix the crown. Don't, don't knock it off her head. I know yes. I needed this and I know our listeners too. Um, I want to grow in this area. I, it, it, it's easy for, for life to beat you up and I'm 20 years older than you are. And so, uh, it, it, you're so far ahead of where I was when I was your age, but life beats you up and you, you just, become okay with some stained clothes and, and you hope the people don't see it. And you just, at least for me, I accept it as my lot in life. But when you describe this clean clothes and this mindful practice of stepping into our Psalm 139-ness, remembering that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that he knew us before we were even in our mother's womb. It reminds me of the whole, also putting on the whole armor of God, but that's a whole nother podcast. But know that we have an enemy that wants us to stay dirty. He yes. loves dark corners. He lives in dark corners. He whispers lies. He, he himself jumps in those dirty puddles to, to stain us, to shame us. How long did it take you for to get into a baseline, though, of, of these habits? And I know you don't do it perfectly every day, but I know that you ha it's a habit. Talk to us a little bit about how you got into this positive self-care mode, including speaking blessings over yourself. It definitely took me a long time and it wasn't really a consistent feeling until I left my marriage and also removed some of those other toxic people from my life. And just as some mornings I wake up and again, I have to forgive those who have hurt me. Some mornings I wake up and I feel ragged and I feel unworthy and I have to forgive myself all over again. And I'm not perfect. So I will continue to make mistakes throughout my life. I'm, I'm sure of that. Or at times others may not value me the way that I deserve to be valued. And based on past experiences, I might allow that to happen and will have to forgive myself and others again. Right. So eventually I think you do get to a point where you can stand in that mirror and looking at yourself, knowing all that you've endured and survived really. And that from which you you've taken and you've become stronger and you don't have to stand in that mirror feeling dirty anymore, feeling unforgivable or feeling like I felt in that moment, like I just so desperately wanted clean sheets. Um, there's a famous quote by, I believe it's Hemingway. And um, it says, the world breaks everyone and often we are stronger at those broken places. Mm. And I, I think that that's such a powerful thing um, because we do, we take a, uh, that huge weight of all of the things that are broken, but who's to say that those broken pieces can't come together and be something more one of a kind and more beautiful. And every single day is new. There's, there's nothing too dirty, especially that Jesus can't clean. Mm -hmm. And as the book of Psalms says, weeping may come for the night, but joy comes in the morning and you deserve that joy. Everybody deserves that joy, that forgiveness. And you deserve those clean clothes and those clean sheets. Yeah. And, you know, really, that's what this whole season, this whole podcast is about. And uh, to kind of uh, jump off a little bit of that quote, Leonard Cohen said, the cracks is how the light gets through. But yeah, yes. listeners, I love that quote. But 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 you, Autumn, me, Amy, all of you out there listening, you deserve to be clean and you can be clean. You already are clean. As I've mentioned so often on this podcast, you are seen, you are known, you are heard you are loved, you are valued. When I asked Autumn on this podcast, I did not see the self-forgiveness coming. Guilt is so often stuck to me like glue. 
And I think of it as a hurdle in forgiving others. When we can't embrace forgiveness, even if there's nothing to forgive that was given to us on the cross, there's no way we can understand or step into our Psalm 139-ness or even know that we're co-heirs with Jesus. I know that, as I've mentioned many times now, not that everyone that listens to this podcast shares our faith, Autumn, but I want to thank you for coming on today. And before I leave, I know that you want to encourage our listeners to do something specific for you and for me and for all of our survivors, sisters and our brothers, because one in four women will be a victim of domestic violence. One in seven men will be. But I know that you have something specifically on your heart, and, and then I'm going to follow that, that, um, that you would like to ask the listeners to do for, for, for those of us who have surrendered our clothing or our sheets to the police after an assault. What would you like people to do so that those people can feel clean? As I mentioned um, to you those years ago and, and even here on this podcast, that overwhelming feeling of just a simple thought, and, and it might have been a metaphor in that moment of, I just want clean sheets, but maybe it was just, I want a clean slate, right. um, that idea of wanting clean sheets. And I know that this podcast, it's heard all over. It's not just here in Florida, but I would like to encourage those of you who are listening to reach out into your local communities and find the different organizations that you can donate, um, whether it's clean clothes clothes, clean sheets. Many times when people are assaulted, their bedding is taken as a part of DNA evidence. And also when people are escaping from domestic violence situations, whether they're leaving a spouse, a parent, any type of abuser, sometimes there isn't time or maybe financial means to be able to pack up all of their belongings and move out. So sometimes all they have are literally just the clothes on their back. Um, and, and children too. It might be their children don't have anything either. So anything that you guys are able to do helps. If you're wanting to donate here in Florida and you need assistance finding some type of domestic violence assistance resources or places to donate, please reach out to me, reach out to Amy. We're happy to help get you connected. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this time last year, we would have had an organization to send you to, but neither one of us are comfortable doing that at this point. And plus, I think that this is so huge. And for for my request, for those of you out there, there's two things that you could that I would that I would say, uh, please consider One, there's an organization and it's only about five, five uh, locations throughout the United States. It's called Love Heals. And one of my friends bought me a package of soaps and lotions and shampoos. Um, and it basically is an organization that is run by survivors of um, human trafficking and uh, domestic violence. And um, it, they employ people plus their outstanding products. They would make great Christmas gifts. Um, and then the other thing that I would that I would suggest, like Autumn said, is donating to the current any anything that you have local that um, would be able to um, help people. One of the things that helped me when I arrived at my apartment after leaving was everyone had provided me everything from a couch to a fork, but especially had provided shampoos and soaps and toothpaste and toothbrushes. And so that's my request. But Autumn, I want to thank you for being on today and for your authenticity. Um, and for this good word for all of us, um, and one, and, and the thing is, is you don't need to be a trauma survivor to feel guilt. It is the most powerful tool used against us, in my opinion. Um, both of us, though, um, yes. when, we, when we talked about this, love this song, and I can't play it for copyright reasons. Um, right. And we're going to end the podcast, and we're going to read the lyrics. And I suggest nobody hit stop right now, because this is a song called Clean by Natalie Grant. And I picked the verses that each of us would read on purpose because we're in different phases of our own healing. And so I would, I wish I could play a portion of it, but I can't and it's such great power. And so as we end this podcast, um, Autumn, I want you to read the first verse and I'll close us out with the second one. Sure. I see shattered and you see whole. I see broken, but you see beautiful. And you're helping me to believe you're restoring me piece by piece. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy and I am clean. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy, I am clean. And what is dead now lives again. My heart's beating, it's beating inside my chest. Oh, I'm coming alive with joy and destiny because you're restoring me piece by piece. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. 
I am clean. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean. Washed in the blood of your sacrifice, your blood flowed red and made me white. My Mm. dirty rags are purified. I am clean. You wash me clean. Oh, you make me clean. Thank you for spending time with us today. And I would like to thank Autumn again for agreeing to come on with us today. It's merely impossible for me to tell you part of my story or any healing without telling you about the star of the story. It is Jesus. I do understand, as I've mentioned many times now, that not every listener shares our faith. But if you want to know more about the star of the story, I am very easy to find on social media. The links are in my show notes. Thank you also to Amy Highland for her excellent production of this episode. And I look forward to spending time with you in two more weeks, only two more episodes in this season. It has been a ride for sure.